Good morning, right. We're going to have a look today at stem cells. And that seemed a, a, probably a good place to start. We were looking in the last one at... It didn't help me there. Um, and the last, that's all right. I'm just talking to Paul, trying to sort out. We looked at differentiation last time. Uh, of We looked at mitosis and then differentiation. Now, all this work goes on with stem cells. So I want to cover stem cells first, and then I want to look at, after that, move on to the next topic, which is digestion. The lessons aren't quite fitting with times and subjects, but it's biology. Who cares? Right, so stem cells. What is, then, a stem cell? Well, I think we can come up with some sort of thing about this. So here we are. It's a stem cell. There we are. An animal stem cell. Really helpful. This stem cell is rather odd because it can make any other type of cell. When uh, a cell is first fertilized and makes a zygote, then this cell is basically a stem cell and it can produce every different type of cell in the human body. The zygote then goes on to form uh, basically... An embryo and by that time we've differentiated we can't make every type of cell so what's going on well the zygote consists of a cell this cell is then going to divide into four or eight cells and it then moves on to form a blastula or blastocyst and if I sort of can do a, a cut through on one of these it's now formed lots of little cells and we've got a clump of cells perhaps say 50 or so in the middle now if we look at what this is this is a ball of cells this was the original zygote divided into lots of balls of cells, not grown much at all. We've got the outside. Now, this is going to implant into the uterus. These cells here are going to form the umbilical cord. The cells around the outside are going to form the amnion and the chorion. The cells over here are going to form the placenta. And that bunch of cells in the middle will form the embryo. Now, the embryo isn't needing to form now the amnion and chorion, because it's been done, or the umbilical cord, because that's been done, or the placenta, because that's been done. So this embryo has switched off some of the genes that are needed here in the zygote. And as this embryo progresses to a fetus, to a baby and to an adult more and more cells are switched off and as we get to this embryo what we're seeing is this differentiation we're forming all the different cells in the body we are forming things like 
the heart, the muscle, the nerves, all the types of cells you can think of. There are about 216 of them, I think, in a normal adult. Many of these differentiated cells then divide up and basically replace themselves. But some tissues can't do this. Heart's one of those particular ones uh, that if you injure your heart, then basically those heart cells which beat are normally replaced by scar tissue cells that replace them but they don't beat and you're gradually getting a, a much more useless heart so many people suffer and die because parts of their body don't work properly uh, they could have problems with their heart they could have problems with their lungs wouldn't it be nice if we could perhaps grow a new one well the uh, there are a few problems with trying to do this um we might be able to try and do some of these things so about 1998 uh, a couple of scientists managed to culture some human embryonic stem cells trying to get them to grow into other types of cells and perhaps trying to get them making some nerve cells or perhaps growing a new uh, trachea for someone or, or something like that. Um, the idea is that if we could do this, then if someone is paralyzed, we might be able to generate some new cells and and stop them being paralyzed and help them walk again there is some work done with um an eye disease called macular degeneration uh this is where the back of the eye is not sort of working properly and if we could inject stem cells into the back of the eye maybe we could get the eye to sort of regenerate those into more retina and get someone to see again well they're, they're trying hard on this and there are clinical trials on working on this very little problem which is not really such a, a little problem how about the heart could we perhaps grow a heart i've seen some experiments where someone took a pig's heart now that's about the same size as a human heart and relatively able to get one quite easily and if you take that heart and then you sort of basically put it in bleach and you kill off all the cells but leave the basic structure of the heart there and then you could take some stem cells and sort of lay them over the heart and try to convince them to start forming the right bits of the heart that you might be able to get a beating heart that is the same genetic makeup as the person who needs that heart and then maybe you could transplant that in we're still a few years away from that but hopefully in your lifetime we're going to see that type of thing happening trying to get these stem cells working and doing something so using these stem cells is possible and a lot of work is being done here how about stem cells in plants well we talked about some of this but we can grow a plant from just few stem cells and the advantage of stem cells that the uh, in a plant is the stem cells they're found in tips of the roots the tips of the shoots and we've also got some 
found in some of the, the joints of plants where a branch comes off. So we can do quite a lot with some of these. And we can work with plants to make all types of extra bits and pieces. So these plant merry stems can produce quite effective plants. And we can use that for all sorts of things, but selling, I suppose, but also for research and perhaps some genetic work as well. So stem cells, quite useful. Now, there appears to be, though, a little problem with stem cells. And we call this the stem cell dilemma. We can do things, but although we can do things, should we do things? Is it right to do things? Is it proper to do things? Well, let's, let's consider some of these things. So let's have a look at some of the, the good points. What might be some of the good points for doing this? Well, let's say we've got a spinal cord injury. Could we replace this? Spinal cord. Let's see if we can replace this. Someone's got diabetes. If they've got diabetes, could you give them some cells that produce insulin and their problem goes away? Could you grow them a new heart? That'd be lovely. Can you give sight to the blind? And possibly hearing to the deaf. Could you repair, which I would appreciate here, damage to bones? I have a problem with my bones. I have a problem called arthritis. My finger won't bend anymore because the bones have grown. If maybe we could grow, grow that, I'd be really happy. But at the moment, a lot of these are still much in the research and investigation stage. So only time's going to tell whether we can do some of those things. But there are also some bad things. Like one of the problems is, well, where are you going to get those stem cells from? We saw that one of the problems that we want to do is we want to get them from an embryo. Hmm. Well, does that mean that something has to die that you can live? I could maybe take one of your stem cells. I could perhaps grow a whole new body for you well it'll be a complete person i suppose really so another living person and then i could kill them and use their organs to keep you happy yeah i can't see that one going to be very popular and in fact this is one of the reasons yep. We don't really want to grow a complete individual. It's a person. It's then saying, well, somebody else has to die so you can live. And that's not right. So if we can try and grow organs, yeah. The bad problem is if we grow an organism. And then we might have to kill that. If I'm going to get some stem cells, maybe we might do something like in vitro fertilization. If I do in vitro fertilization, some eggs from a female are taken, some sperm from a male, they're mixed in a test tube, and then some of those cells are implanted back into the female to grow. How about the rest? Could I use those? 
Is it right to use those? Maybe we could take an umbilical cord from a baby that's just been born. The umbilical cord's not going to be used anymore. Could I take the cells from there? Could I store those cells for that individual? Or could I use it perhaps for somebody else? These are all the ethical decisions that affect a lot of biology. It's not that can we do something. It's should we do something. Is it right to do something? Some cultures say yes. Some cultures say no. Some people say yes. And other people say no. I don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong. I have an opinion. But countries, individuals, they make laws and they try to say that this is the way that we're going to behave. So treatment of some of these diseases and illnesses and problems may be possible. Therapeutic cloning, an embryo could be produced with the same genes as the patient so that they won't reject the, bit, the various things. But then is terminating that embryo murder? So there are potential risks and there are ethical and religious reasons why perhaps we shouldn't do these things. Really, for a lot of these things, it's up to you to decide. Now, let's move on to our next topic, which is organisation and the digestive system. I just want to get some paper. Life isn't working well for me at the moment. I get several sheets when I want one. Right, let's start with how things are organised. We've talked so far about cells zoom in a little bit so a cell is the smallest unit of an organism cells are collected together in tissues so we have a collection of different types of cell in a tissue so for instance muscular tissue all right so it's got cells that can contract but it might have some glands in there which can secrete substances, enzymes, hormones. We might have blood supply, various things. So tissues, quite complicated things. If we collect a whole load of these tissues, different tissues together, we can make an organ such as a proper muscle to churn, if you like, the food in your stomach and release the digestive juices. We can have glandular tissue in there producing the digestive ju um, juices. We can have epithelial tissue in there, which covers the inside and the outside of the stomach. So quite a lot of things make up an organ. And when we put several of these organs together, we make an organ system. And some of these systems will be probably familiar to you. Things like the digestive system, the circulatory system, the nervous system, the gas exchange system. And we collect all those systems together and put them together to make an organism. So collection of cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make organ systems, and organ systems make up an organism. So we've got here a structure. So a common question that we get is, can you identify 
which is a cell, what is a tissue, what is an organ, and perhaps an organ system. These are normally for the larger multicellular organisms. Some of the smaller organisms, well, they can exist at a cellular level. And there are a few, I suppose, that are more at a tissue level. But I don't think I can give you any other organisms that just have one organ or one organ system. And that's not saying there might not be. It's just saying that I don't think I can probably do that. Right. Our next thing to move on to is looking at one of those systems. And I'm going to look at the digestive system. To do this, I'm going to use something my wife knitted for me. And can I go to the other camera? Yep. What I've got is a little box here. And in here is my model guts. Hmm. Here we have it. It's, it's probably, probably about, about life size, size really, really for me. me. Uh, uh, it's, it's this bag, bag not probably not quite as wide as I am, it's probably a little bit taller than I am. But, but this, this is, is basically, basically everything, everything in your, in your gut. gut. We've, We've got, got the small, small intestine, intestine I can see, see here. here. I can, I can see, see the large intestine. intestine. I can I see the liver. I can see a pancreas. Well, well, let's take it out and have a look. look. And, and what I want to do is look at the story of digestion from the mouth down through the stomach, through the small intestine, large intestine, out to the anus. So let's have a look at this and see what we can do. To start with, then, let's look at where we're going to actually start. And we're going to look at the story of the ham sandwich. Now, my ham sandwich consists of a couple of slices of bread. And this is made up from a carbohydrate. I've got in here some butter, which is a fat. And in there, I've also got my slice of ham, which in this case is going to be protein. I've chosen a ham sandwich. We could have chosen any particular food as long as they've got in them carbohydrate, fat, and protein. We'll also find various other things that are in here, because ham is actually cells. These are more synthetic types of food. Then the ham will also have in it some vitamins, some minerals, we're probably going to find in here some fiber, the things that can't be digested, probably in the bread here, and surprisingly, an amount of water. So this is what we've got to try and deal with in the body. And the first thing we're going to try and deal with is the carbohydrate. Let's have a look. So, so starting off, off in the mouth, mouth we've, we've got, got the tongue. tongue. So, so this, this is, is probably, probably about, about the size, the size of, my of my tongue. tongue. It's, it's a, a lot, lot bigger than, than most people, people think, think it is. is. And, and 
around, around the, the tongue, tongue will also have, have some saliva, saliva glands. glands. And the these saliva, saliva glands will secrete saliva, saliva which consists of mucus to envelop the food, food to make, make it sort of able to be swallowed. swallowed. We've got We've the got teeth, teeth, which are going to rip the food, the food up, up into smaller, smaller manageable, manageable pieces, pieces, break it down so that the enzymes, enzymes can actually get, get at the food. food. And, and then, then we've also, also got, got going with this, an enzyme, an enzyme. salivary, salivary amylase. And, and this is going to break down, down the food into its constituent, its constituent parts. parts. The food, the food we're, we're looking, looking at is a carbohydrate. carbohydrate. So, so the, the bread, bread we, we start putting in our mouth and we start to chew it. If you want to try this experiment at home, it's quite a horrible one to do. And that, and that is, is to take, take a, slice a slice of bread. bread. You take a slice of bread, put it in your mouth, and you chew. And you chew. And you do more chewing. And you don't swallow. It starts to become this sort of mush. And you still chew. And after a few moments, this is just bread, no butter, no ham, just plain bread. You feel it starts to get a little bit sweeter. And you might just taste it getting a little bit sweeter. And we can do experiments to show that this works. And next time we'll probably have a go at this experiment to have a look and see what we can do. So I've got my bread. It's starting to be turned into sugar. And then I swallow it. And it goes down this long tube. My esophagus towards the stomach. So, so let's, let's take, take a, a few, few bits, bits and pieces, pieces out, out here. here. So, so. Let's put my tongue, tongue up there. I've got this tube going, going down, down here, here to my, my stomach, stomach, which is which about, about here. here. And, and connected, connected to, to this, this I've, I've got, got two, two other organs. organs. I've, I've got, got let's just try like this a bit, a bit more, more anatomically, anatomically correct. correct. Yeah, yeah got, got a problem with me. Esophagus, it keeps escaping. escaping. I've, I've got, got my, my liver. liver. Let's, Let's think of this as number, number one, because it does one thing. thing. We've, We've got, got my stomach, stomach which is in the middle here, and it does two, two things. things. And, and we've got my, my pancreas, pancreas over on this side. side. And, and this, this pancreas, pancreas does... There we are. Three, three things. things. So... so it's, it's reasonably, reasonably life-sized. Life my, my stomach's a bit, a bit smaller. smaller. I haven't really eaten much. much. It will it swell up if I eat lots, lots of stuff. stuff. My, my pancreas, pancreas produces enzymes. enzymes and, and I've got my, my liver, liver, which, which uh, also, also has on it the gallbladder, gall which, which goes into the small, small intestine. intestine. So, so let's, let's think, think about, about what's, what's going, going on. on. My system then is going to look like this. So we arrive down the esophagus at my stomach. There we are, my bag for my stomach. And I'm going to give this number two. Number one is going to be my liver. Liver is quite a big organism. We're going to give it number one. And that's got a gallbladder. And that's going to supply bile to the small intestine. So my liver, it's going to provide one thing, bile. We'll look at what that does in a moment. We've got my stomach. 
And this is going to provide two things. It's going to provide, first of all, acid. And the job of the acid really is to kill bacteria. Not exclusively, but it will. It also aids digestion a bit. And we've also got some more enzymes. And the enzymes in here are called proteases. The protease here is actually called pepsin. And this breaks down my protein that I've eaten, my ham, into shorter chains. I can call these polypeptides. And it'll break them also down into the constituent parts, which are the amino acids. So my protein is being broken down. We then go on to number three, produces three things. This is the pancreas. And it's producing three main enzymes. It's producing amylase, pancreatic this time amylase, which is a carbohydrate. They all end in A's. A's is a, a name for enzyme. So virtually all the enzymes have A's after them. So the obvious one there is pepsin, which doesn't. So we've got carbohydrates. We have a lipase. This breaks lipids down. And we've got, again, more proteases. One called trypsin, which breaks down proteins or polypeptides into amino acids. So in our mouth, we've done initial digestion with some amylase, although having watched many students in the dining hall, it's amazing that the amylase has any time to work at all because the food seems to go in through the mouth and into the stomach in less than a second or so. Uh, chewing is tends to be seems to be optional. But basically, we want to break our food down. In the old days, we'd be talking about someone chewing their food perhaps a hundred times before it comes down the esophagus. So the enzymes had time to work. Proteases, then breaking down the proteins. And the acid will also hydrolyze some of the carbohydrates and start breaking them up as well. We then need to go into the small intestine. And the bile is released and it's going to change the pH. This is the job, the role of the bile. It's going to change the pH from about 2 in the stomach to probably about 7 in the small intestine. The bile has another function, and that is to emulsify the fats what do I mean by emulsify the fats well basically the fats are water phobic they really don't like water they're hydrophobic so basically this mushes up the fats and puts them in tiny little fat droplets that now will dissolve in the water. 
And this means that the enzyme, the lipase, can actually get at these fats. So the bile, two functions to neutralize the acid and to emulsify the fats. And then going on to the small intestine, the pancreas is releasing carbohydrates, lipase, and proteins. Carbohydrates to break down the carbohydrates into simple sugars. The lipases break down the lipids or fats and oils into fatty acids and glycerol. And the proteases breaking down the proteins into amino acids. Let's look at this. So we've, we've got, got tongue, the esophagus, I've, I've got my stomach, stomach I've got my, my pancreas, pancreas, I've got my liver, liver and, and then, then oh, I think I'm going to leave that. that. I've, I've got, got my small intestine. intestine. And, and let's, let's take, take out, out my small, small intestine. intestine. And, and you can, you can see, see that, that I've got, got well, well, loads, loads of, of it. it. More, 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 more. There we are. There, there is my amount, amount of small, of small intestine. intestine. All, All down, down here in my, my gut. gut. This, this small, small intestine, intestine, it's big enough to go across, across my, my kitchen, kitchen and back, back again. again. We're looking, We're looking at, at sort of five or so meters here of small intestine, intestine that my poor my wife knitted for me. What goes on here? here? Well, well, largely, largely lots, lots of digestion. Of digestion. But, as but as well, well as this, this we, we start, start to do absorption. absorption. Let's have Let's a look have at that. that. To do the absorption, what we want to do is we want to have a look at, need a new piece of paper, what goes on inside the small intestine. So our small intestine then, if I look at the wall of this, isn't flat and smooth. Instead, we've got these things that stick into the side of the wall of the small intestine. So this is the inside. This is inside your gut, and this is the outside. And the food comes along here. Now, the advantage of having this much increased surface area is that we can use this to absorb the food. And inside one of these little villi, as they're called, or villas for one, villi for multiple, We've got some different things in them. We've got blood vessels going in around and out, these little capillaries, and they're going to pick up the water-soluble substances. It's going to pick up the amino acids or amino acids is going to pick up the simple sugars, the maltose, the glucose, maybe lactose. We've also got another system in here, the lymphatic system.
And a lot of the lymphatic system will pick up many of the, the fats. They're going to be their fatty acids, glycerol. They're going to go everywhere. Just realized I wasn't showing you what I was writing. Nobody told me. Right, so we've got water-soluble things in the capillaries. And we've got some other things. Not exclusively, they're, they're all going to go everywhere. And this is going to be taken towards the liver and on eventually to all the cells in the body. I'll position my picture elsewhere. So it's going to go to all cells in the body. So we've got this huge surface area. But if I look at the wall of this villus, then if I were to look at the wall of that, it's got these sort of little microvilli on the side of each cell. So each cell is going to have these little microvilli on it. And that is going to then make the surface area of the cell much, much larger. So this is just the wall of that villus. Huge surface area. Even bigger than the lungs. So bigger than probably a tennis court. So sort of getting on for a half a football pitch. Enormous amount of surface area to absorb all this food. So let's translate what foods we've actually managed to get. So we take our carbohydrate. And the carbohydrate is broken down by a carbohydrase. And it forms sugars. An example of a carbohydrase might be amylase, maltase. Maltase changes maltose, the sugar, into glucose. We've got some lipase. So we take some lipids, some fats. These are broken down by a lipase into fatty acids and glycerol. We get our protein, the ham in our ham sandwich. That's broken down by proteases. An example of a protease could be pepsin, trypsin, and these proteases break the proteins down into eventually amino acids. We've got other bits in the gut. We've got water to deal with. We've got fibre to do, limit, work out. Some of the minerals may just be absorbed, unchanged. Some of the vitamins may be absorbed, unchanged. So let's deal with the water and the fibre. The water and the fibre, well, well, the small, small intestine, intestine ends, ends up right, right, right down here, here at the bottom. At the bottom. And, and you've, you've got, got an, an extra, extra little, little 
a bit, a of, bit gut of gut that you don't, don't use. This, this is, is the appendix. appendix. Uh, uh, in, some in some people, people this, this gets inflamed and causes a bit of a nuisance, and, and they just lock it out of the body. body. This, this then, then rises, rises up, up goes, goes around, around down, down, and, and eventually, eventually comes out to the rectum and the anus, anus basically a little valve, valve because you don't particularly want to poop all, all the time you're going, going around. around. And, and so, so we can, can store, store up the waste, waste material, the stuff that can't be digested, digested. And, by and by that, that we're looking, looking at the fiber. And, and the fiber is good for you, you because it keeps your, your digestive, digestive system going. going. So, so a, a massive, massive system. system. And it and all fits, fits in, in a small, small container, container, your body. body. We'll put we'll in, in our, first, first of all, our large intestine. intestine. And, and this goes, goes up, up around, around the body, the body and eventually and down to the bottom where we've got our appendix. I certainly, certainly wouldn't make a surgeon, surgeon trying to put all this stuff back in. Then we've got, got about five meters or so of small intestine, and I'm going to sort of stuff this in. in. It, if I were a doctor, we could assume that the patient would probably die with this system of uh, putting, putting in. So, so I, think I think the world, the world can be grateful, grateful that I didn't I did become, become a surgeon. surgeon. Then we'll put we'll in our uh, pancreas. pancreas. On, top On top of that, of that we're going to put in the stomach. stomach. Around, Around there, there, we're, we're going to put, put in, in the liver. liver. And then, and then sticking, sticking out of that, that system, system we've, we've got, got the, the esophagus and the, and the tongue. tongue. But for me, I'm just, just going to lay them in the top. top. And put it away for next time. So there we are. There's your guide through the digestive system. I hope that was sort of useful to give you some ideas about what goes on and where it goes on and playing around with the woolly version of the digestive system is a lot nicer than some of the other systems that I've come across, a lot nicer than trying to play around with the real thing, which is all squidgy and horrible. The wool one is quite friendly, so uh, quite popular. Now, next time, we're going to have a look at food tests. There are some videos I've done already of food tests, and if you want to have a look at some of those, you can. Or you can join me next Tuesday when I'm going to have a go at trying to do this live, and we'll see what uh, can go wrong. Take care, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Take care. Bye-bye.